So with no further ado, I think we'll directly transition to our next great talk that I'm really looking forward to because AppSync is something I'm writing right now on a project. So we'll have Nedo talk about building real-time backends on AppSync with CDK. And I think this will be a great talk. That's right. I'm excited about this. If you watch, you have to keep up. Nader is the fastest coder on the face of the planet. Uh, so I, I've watched him in meetings create full applications while I was trying to stay awake. So uh, with, without further ado, we're excited to see you, Nader. And here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to build real-time backends using GraphQL, AWS AppSync, and CDK. I'm really excited to be here at CDK Day, um, my first CDK talk, so I'm pretty excited about that. My name is Nader Dabit. I work as a senior developer advocate on the web and mobile team here at AWS. Been here for a little over two and a half years. So let's go ahead and dive right in because we have a lot to cover. First, I'm going to be doing an introduction to GraphQL. We're going to then look at AWS AppSync and how GraphQL fits into that. We're going to then look at how the CDK classes and constructs allow us to use AWS services to build an AppSync API. And then we're going to do a live coding demo, building an API from scratch and deploying it and testing it out. So let's dive into GraphQL. What is GraphQL? Well, if you look on the internet, you might see this definition, a query language for your API. This doesn't really tell you a lot about what GraphQL is, so let's dive a little deeper. At the end of the day, a GraphQL API allows you to do this. You describe your data using a GraphQL schema, and your data is not only described here in your schema, but also the operations against your data. So here you might define uh, a type of project, but you also might uh, define methods to create, read, update, delete, and subscribe to different uh, projects being created, updated, or deleted. You might also have a definition here for a real-time operation for when a new project is created, you want to subscribe to that, that update. So you have your schema describing all of your data. And then once your API is live, you can then ask your, uh, your API for the data that you would like. And one of the powerful things that uh, GraphQL brings to the table is this idea of only getting the data that you've asked for. So if you've uh, ever worked with a REST API and you have an endpoint for something like people, and then you get each person, they have maybe uh, you know, 10 or 12 different pieces of metadata that you have there, but maybe you only want the name. With GraphQL, you can only ask for that data. So you can ask for only the data that you want without having to modify your API. Once it's there, it works, and you get only the data that you'd like to be returned. So let's take a look at how GraphQL API is built. A GraphQL API consists of three main parts, which we'll dive into a little deeper. You have a GraphQL schema, you have your resolvers, and then you have your data sources. The schema is what we looked at just a moment ago. It's essentially all of the data and all of the operations that are available for your API. So for a simple to-do app, we might have a type of to-do, a few different fields on that to-do. If it has an exclamation point, it's a required field. If it does not, it's uh, nullable or it's optional. We then have different operations like queries and mutations, which map to rest uh, calls of something like a get or a put or a post. So after we've defined our types, our operations, we're now ready to move on to the next step. We then need to have data sources. So when we're operating with these uh, queries and mutations, where is this data coming from? That is where we define our data sources, and then we have our operations that map to these data sources and bring data back to the uh, API on the, in the response. So how does this mapping happen? The mapping happens using GraphQL resolvers. And GraphQL resolvers are really an implementation detail depending on the person building the API or the service. And essentially what they are are functions or some type of code that maps the operation to the data source. So this might be Python, it might be TypeScript, it might be whatever your language is uh, that you're using for your API, or if you're using a managed service, whatever their flavor is. Data sources come in a bunch of different ways. So uh, you could think of a data source not only as a database, but also as some type of um, either a you know mapping to some other service somewhere. So maybe some microservice or even to a serverless function, which we're going to be doing here in, in, in our example. Um, one of the really interesting things about GraphQL is the data fetching. So let's dive into that a little bit more and look at the differences between GraphQL and REST. Um, well, in GraphQL, like I mentioned, we have this idea of queries, mutations, and subscriptions. 
And these actually map really well to HTTP requests. So when you think of a query, you're typically going to be reading data. When you think of a mutation, you're typically going to be creating, updating, or deleting data. And then if you need any type of real-time updates, those are typically done in the subscriptions. And then after we kind of understand this at a base level, we can now kind of map these operations to HTTP verbs that we're probably used to working with. So when we think of a GET request, all of this is going to be mapped to a GraphQL query. Everything else is going to be mapped to a GraphQL mutation. So posts, puts, deletes, patches, any type of update, you could think of that being done in a GraphQL mutation. Any type of reading is going to be done in a query. And then uh, once you know that, you're kind of good to go as far as theoretical uh, you know, ideas around uh, data fetching in GraphQL. So let's take a look at how these GraphQL operations actually work. Like I mentioned with uh, at the beginning, you know, one of the really great things about GraphQL is that you do have the ability to only fetch the data that, the data that you would like. So let's take, for example, we have this base query of get to do, and the to do uh, type has four fields. We have an ID, a name, a completed, and a created at field. We can map this operation, and we can say, okay, we want to get all of this data in this request. So we're going to say get to do. We want to return the ID, name, completed, and created at values. We'll get all of that back. But what if we only wanted a couple of these fields? We could do that as well. All we need to do would be to change our query and whatever we would like to be returned. In this example, just the name and the completed values. That's all that's going to come back. Uh, therefore, reducing you know the payload size for this operation. So. Next, let's take a look at GraphQL subscriptions. This is kind of the real-time aspect of GraphQL. GraphQL subscriptions enable real-time communication between the client and the API. Subscriptions are event-based. So if you've ever um, worked with some type of uh, mutation in your API, you can then attach a GraphQL subscription to that. So let's say you have a typical CRUD app, create, read, update, delete. And let's say we have a to-do app. You might, see on, you might say on create, on update, on delete. I want to subscribe to all of those changes. And then you can have a subscription open between your API and your client. Any data that is going to be um, part of those events of the create, update, or delete will be then be sent down to the client. This is done in a two-way communication. So when you open a subscription, you have a way to communicate to the server and the server back to the client. Um, and the implementation is kind of not really specified. So there's a GraphQL spec for the subscription, but the implement, implementation is kind of up to you. So if you're building out your own API, you might use something like WebSockets or you might use something um, like Service and Events. But most of the time you're seeing people using uh, WebSockets for GraphQL subscription. So they're implementation agnostic, but typically uh, they're done using WebSockets. And, and subscriptions work really just like mutations and queries. You say uh, you define your subscription, and then you can then use that subscription or subscribe to these changes on your client, and then you're getting the data that you would like to get back. Um, but just like a, in GraphQL mutations and queries, you can also only ask for a, a subset of the fields. So in this example, we have an onCreate to do subscription that's available. We can get the ID, name, completed, and created at values back but maybe we only need the ID, the name, and the completed values. We can create that subscription and have that work just fine. Here, we're gonna say, okay, we only want the ID, the name, and the completed values. We're only getting that data back in the subscription. So now that we kind of have gone over uh, GraphQL briefly, let's now look at AWS AppSync. Well, AppSync is essentially just a managed GraphQL service. So you have all of this stuff built in for you. And what a lot of people are using uh, AppSync for as kind of like an API gateway or a consistent API layer for any AWS service or any AWS uh, data source. Um, with AppSync, we have conflict detection and conflict resolution built in if you need that. And this is done both on the client and on the server using our client side SDKs and libraries. We have enterprise security features built in. So if you need some type of auth or multi auth, we have that built in using Cognito. You can bring your own auth provider using OIDC, IAM, API keys for public access, or a combination of uh, or two or more of those. Um, so, and, and, and we make it really easy to add real-time functionality to your app, as you're about to see in just a moment. So any mutation has subscriptions built in into the service. So all you need to do is add uh, one line of code into your GraphQL schema, um, one additional line of code, and you're ready to go with any real-time updates for any of your mutations. And then we also have that we maintain for our team client SDKs 
for web, iOS, Android, React Native, and Flutter now. So, App Sync with CDK. This is what we're here to talk about. Let's tell. Let's now talk about using all of these ideas that we just talked about with CDK. How this is how this is going to actually happen, and uh, and kind of build this out in just a moment in a live demo. So to get started, we're going to install the CDK packages that we need. So with App Sync, you're not only going to install the App Sync CDK packages, but you're going to also need um, packages for all of the other, you know. Uh, data sources and services that you might be be needing as well. So for a typical GraphQL API, you might need a Lambda function, you might need DynamoDB. So you would install all of these things like you would in a normal uh, CDK app. You then create and configure an API. So uh, once we've installed you know, our CDK for AppSync and other data sources, we're gonna then kind of create an API reference. And then we're gonna start modifying that API by adding data sources, adding resolvers and things like that. So we're going to add data sources. We're going to then add resolvers to these data sources. And then we're going to deploy and we're going to kind of uh, have our CDK app. So I think that is an intro. But I think really the interesting part is actually doing this in code and seeing the code itself and then deploying it and actually testing it out. This is the fun part. And I think this is where you're going to learn a little bit more about how all this works. So let's go ahead and test this out. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a, a folder where I've created a, a CDK project. Um, and here, basically, what I have done is just uh, initialized a new TypeScript app with CDK. And I have installed a couple of node modules. The node modules I've installed are CDK AppSync, uh, DynamoDB, and Lambda. And what we're going to do is kind of build from scratch our, our entire app. And we're going to kind of deploy that and hopefully get that done in just a couple of minutes. So like I mentioned, the first thing we need to do is um, you know create the API. But be before we do that, we need our imports. So we're going to go here to the top of our file. Whoops. And we're going to go ahead and uh, import the things that we need. So we're importing AppSync. We're importing DynamoDB. And we're importing uh, Lambda. Next, we're going to go ahead and create the API. So here we have our API declaration. We're calling this uh, API API. And then we're going to say um, we're going to need a new AppSync GraphQL API. We're going to then give the API a name. And this is going to be the name that is in your dashboard. So um, in the service itself, this is kind of what you're giving the name to this, to this API. I'm trying to zoom in to where this looks good. I think this is a good uh, zoom level. So the name of this API is going to be CDK Notes uh, AppSync API. We then need to define our GraphQL schema. And this is essentially going to be kind of the location for your GraphQL schema. So I've defined this as GraphQL slash schema.graphql. And here in this GraphQL folder, we're going to write our schema in just a second. And then we have our authorization configuration. Now, I mentioned that we have authorization and uh, you know all that built into the service. And you can do multiple authorization types. And to do kind of your authorization configuration, you need to have a default authorization, and then you add any additional authorization modes. So you have you need one default, and for this example, I'm using a default of API key. And then also, I'm I'm kind of showing here if you'd like to have additional authorization modes, there is a field that you can add um, or a uh, a key for additional authorization modes. And then I'm just enabling X-ray, so we can get a little bit more detail about the the logging. Um, so now that we've done this, we want to go ahead and look at our GraphQL schema. So I'm going to go here. And our schema is empty, but we're going to need a schema for a notes app. Uh, notes app. So I'm going to go ahead and create a schema here. So we have a type of note. And the note has an ID, a name, and a completed Boolean. We then want to define operations against this note. So we have a query. We have a mutation. And we have a subscription. The query that we have is a list notes query. And it's, this returns an array of notes. Um, we also have a create note mutation that takes a note as an argument and returns a note. And for GraphQL input types like this, we actually have to define a, a separate type. So we have a base type and then we have an input type. Input types are essentially the arguments that you're going to be passing um, into your operation. So that's kind of why we have this note input here. And then we want to make a subscription for whenever someone creates a new note. So what I've done here is I have on create note note. And this is kind of the description definition itself. 
But to enable subscription on the service to kind of have all of this configured and wired together on the service side, all we need to do is say at AWS underscore subscribe and pass in the array of mutations we would like this subscription to fire on. So here on create node, we wanna make this subscription fire when a new node is created. Therefore, the subscription uh, operation that we're passing in here for the mutations is create node. So whenever someone creates a new node, this subscription we're gonna fire is gonna fire and therefore we have our real time functionality going there. So our schema is done and we can close this and continue on. So the next thing we wanna do is do some, um, some logging. So we might want to, for our client application, have the GraphQL API URL. We might wanna have the GraphQL API key and maybe even the region. So that's kind of some pretty basic logging stuff we're just gonna log out there. The next thing we might wanna do is go ahead and add our uh, data source. So for this, we're gonna have a Lambda function as the data source, meaning we're gonna map all of the GraphQL operations into a Lambda function. And in the event, we're gonna then have all of the metadata about the operation. So we're gonna have arguments, we're gonna have things like the query or the mutation, we're gonna have the field names, all that stuff is, is gonna be there in the Lambda, essentially turning this into something like a GraphQL version of API gateway mapping to Lambda, if you've ever worked in that, that scenario. Opening up you know, a lot of op opportunity for you, to, for you to do stuff. And also letting you write in your own favorite programming language. In this example, we're gonna be writing in JavaScript or TypeScript. So to do that, you know, you've probably done, you've probably set up a Lambda before if you're here at this event using CDK. If not, we're just kind of creating a new Lambda function with a couple of pieces of configuration. We're gonna go ahead and set the folder as Lambda FN, uh, FNS. So I have that folder created here with a few empty functions. We're defining the handler and we're defining a memory size. And then we're attaching this um, function as a data source by this line right here, which is really interesting because this is kind of you know specific to AppSync. We're saying, you know, we define the API uh, way up here. Go up a little bit. We define the API, you know, right here. We're saying const API. And now we're actually using that right here. We're saying api.add lambda data source passing in uh, the data source name or reference and then the actual data source. So now that we've created that data source, what we can do now is create resolvers on the data source. So what we wanna do is have two resolvers, one resolver for the query and one resolver for the mutation. We don't need resolver for the subscription. Subscription is gonna be wired up automatically for us. So here we're saying, uh, we wanna say Lambda data source, create resolver, the type name is query and the field name is list notes. So if we go down to, uh, if we go back to our GraphQL schema, we'll see that we have a field of query. I'm sorry, we have a type name of query and a field of list notes. We have a type name of mutation and a field of, of uh, create note. <clears throat> That's kind of what's going on here. We're just kind of uh, referencing those fields and those uh, type names. Finally, we wanna do something with this operation. So what are we gonna do? In this example, we're gonna map this into a DynamoDB operation. So uh, what we wanna do is have a, uh, a new DynamoDB table. So that's what we're doing here. And the, the, these is, this is kind of the uh, four new lines we just added. We're gonna create a table called notes table, um, creating a new DynamoDB table. We're gonna then grant access uh, from the Lambda function to the table using notes table .grant full access uh, notes lambda. And this way the, uh, the lambda can operate against the DynamoDB table. And then we're gonna create an environment variable because we're gonna need a way to reference this table name in the lambda function code dynamically um, without hard, hard coding anything there. So what we've done now is kind of built out this thing from top to bottom. We created the API. We then uh, you know, created a lambda function as a data source. We then created resolvers to map to that data source. And then we created a new table that is gonna be having access from that data source, which is the Lambda function. And this is it, this is all, this is all we, we need to do. And we did this in like, you know, about 70 lines of code, give or take, actually 60 or so if we remove the comments and, and other stuff. And then we're really done. We can go ahead and save this and, uh, and jump out. So what I wanna do now is we need to actually write the code for these Lambda functions. So uh, we'll, we'll jump through this real quick. We have a note type for, uh, for since we're using TypeScript, the note is gonna kind of be mapping directly to our GraphQL schema, 
which is pretty nice. So we have an ID, a name, and a completed Boolean, and then we're done there. Um, I think the most interesting thing is going to be here. Um, well, we're going to like look at this main entry point for our Lambda function. So the entry point for our, um, you know, for the function is going to be this main.ts. And here in the uh, event, we're having this app sync event that I've created a type for. So you can kind of get a decent idea of what's coming into this event. We have two main properties we're going to be working with off of the event. One is the info. And this has information about the operation itself. So things like uh, the type name and the field name, all of that's going to be here on the info object. We also have arguments. So any arguments that are passed into the operation, uh, be it a query or a mutation, will be available in this arguments op uh, object. So in this example, we're saying, okay, we have the note ID or the note. All these could be part of this uh, of the arguments. And then in the actual uh, event, we're going to be using two. Uh, actually, three different fields uh, off of the um, operation. We're going to be saying we want to use the info.field name, and the field name is going to basically be uh, create note or list notes. We also have uh, the note itself, and the note is of, of type note. So we might be having a create note. And then also, if we ever needed to like get note by ID or delete note, we could have the note ID available as well. And that could be passed in as a mutation, even though we're not really using it. So I guess the two fields uh, are the two properties that we're going to be working with are the event.info.field name. That is going to be either create note or list notes. And then we have the event.arguments. And this is going to be like the, the arguments that are passed in. And uh, right now we only have a note that we're going to be working with. Um, if it's the list notes query, we don't need any arguments. We're just going to scan the DynamoDB table and kind of return all the results there. So that's the main entry point. Let's go ahead and save that and then just go ahead and create these two um, these two functions. One is uh, list notes, and this is just going to perform a DynamoDB scan. Uh, we are referencing the process env dots. Uh, um, variable, so notes table. This was what we created in our CDK, in our CDK app. And then for uh, create note, this is a pretty basic operation uh, DynamoDB put. We're just going to take the note and we're going to say the note is the item and we're going to call dot client dot put. And basically we're, you know, interacting with DynamoDB from our Lambda function. So we're ready to test this out. So what I want to do now is go to uh, here, and we're going to say npm run build. Go ahead and build this out. And then once the build is done, CDK deploy. And what we're going to see is that we're going to go ahead and uh, do this one operation. And after this is done deploying, we should have our working API. So we will go ahead and give that a second to deploy. And once it's deployed, we'll see that we have our API key logged out. We'll have our GraphQL API uh, URL endpoint, our region logged out. We should be ready to test this thing out. So what we'll do is we'll go to the AppSync console. And I'll zoom in a little bit or a lot bit. Oh, that's too much. And we're going to look for the Notes app. And there we go. So our API has been deployed. Now we're going to test it out. So let's run a query that uh, we probably know is not going to be there because there's no data there yet. But let's go ahead and try it out anyway. See if we can get like an empty array back. All right. So um, operations seem to be working. So let's go ahead and create a new note. We got to pass in a notes. All right, so there's our note. Looks like that came back. 
successfully and we now see that our API is working. So um, let's create one more notes. And what we wanna do now is test out the real-time functionality. So we wanna test out that GraphQL subscription. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and open up a new tab over here. And I will uh, open another another you know version of the console over here. And what I'd like to do is uh, create a subscription. So I'm gonna say subscription on create notes. And when a new note is created, I wanna get back uh, maybe just the name and the completed value. So let's go ahead and subscribe to that here and then we'll do one more. We'll do like a real Tom notes. And there we go. The real time uh, data comes through in our subscription and um, we are now subscribed to changes. And, you know, whoops, let's do one, uh, change this a little bit. And we see that those changes are coming through here. So that, that was it. That was pretty simple to create, you know, an API from scratch. We did that in just a couple of minutes. So, um, and with that, I will go ahead and finish this off. So thank you so much for checking this out. Uh, my name is, uh, again, Natter Dabit. I'm Dabit3 on Twitter. Um, if you look on my GitHub, you'll actually see this project, you know, there for you to deploy. It's called AppSync CDK Backend. So if you're interested in that, go to github.com. Uh, slash dabit3, and you'll see that uh, the CDK AppSync backend project is somewhere at the very top of my GitHub repos. So uh, again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned a little bit and I'm um, looking forward to seeing the rest of the talks for CDK Day. Yeah, thanks that for this perfect talk. And I was so happy to see this because yeah, a spoiler, I wrote the initial AppSync code in CDK, so I'm really happy that somebody's using it. And yeah, and you can um, see a blog post um, he wrote um, on the AWS blog. It's about two days old, I think. So you can read all these things again. Over to Marek. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks also, Nader, for a great talk.